So why don't we put our minds together and meditate on peace with the faith of a child. Teddy here, and again, I'm sorry that the live stream had some struggles last week, but definitely at least wanted to get uh, the scripture and the message out here on YouTube for those that missed it this week. And again, we hope to have it back up and ready to go this Sunday, but we definitely appreciate your flexibility and understanding as we uh, live out this worship time together in our different spaces across our church. Uh, so let's begin with just a moment of quiet to prepare ourselves for a time of thought and worship. lesson for us this day comes from James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. Hear these words inspired by God, and may God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of in iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people, made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh.
We all know that person. Whether it's some celebrity we see on TV or that friend we used to have in college and now only really see on Facebook, we all know that person who seems to talk out of both sides of their mouths. With one breath they say they follow the teachings of Christ. Yeah, we know they cheated on that assignment that one time in high school. They claim to be Christian and care about those around them, yet they drive that car way too fast, putting those same people in danger. They claim to love their neighbor, and yet they turn the other way when that man on the street corner holding a sign for help looks directly at them. And then we take a deep breath and realize we are all too often those same people. In fact, those three examples I just listed are not made-up stories. They are things that I, your pastor, have done. And we just heard James say that any teacher of God's word will be judged even more harshly. As I mentioned last week, James is not an easy book to read. James at times may sound like he is scolding you, and maybe he is. But before we go much further, let's figure out more about what's going on here. James's letter is not anything like that of Paul's many letters. Paul is writing to a specific place and time mentioning issues that are important for that community. James is writing to a general group of people, mostly Messianic Jews, outside of Israel. And while they may sound harsh, the teachings are much more general and applicable to people of many places and times. Again, James is tough. There's no patting yourself on the back. There are no feelings of victory that you have avoided the sins James speaks of. Because we all do the things James speaks of. So James encourages two things, action and an inward focus. If we take a breath when reading James and listen more to the takeaway lessons he is sharing, we may even begin to recognize them as similar to those of Christ. And there's a good reason for that. Christian tradition shares that James is the son of Mary and Joseph, and therefore a half-brother of Christ. He was a leader in the early church in Jerusalem, and like many early church leaders, was later martyred. Paul recognizes James as a pillar of the church in his letter to the Galatians, and he has, was one, excuse me, was one that Jesus showed himself to after the resurrection. And many of the analogies he used sound very similar or nearly identical to the ones used in the Gospels. Trees bearing fruit, loving your neighbor, these should all immediately take you in your mind to Gospel lessons of Jesus Christ. So before we dismiss James as some grumpy guy just trying to tell us what to do, maybe we, excuse me, maybe we should listen in a little closer. To this wise man Jesus obviously trusted. So James is here with what really is a simple yet vital reminder. Words matter. In researching this text this week, two very important things were pointed out to me about the importance of words from Jackie Perry. She reminded us that in the creation story that opens our holy scriptures, God does not wave a magic wand or mix together some kind of potion to create the world. God uses words. God said, let there be light. She also asked the question, think about the first time you remember that someone made you feel less than. It was most likely their words that did that to you. Words can literally create, and words can violently tear down. The tongue we use to form these words is therefore disproportionately powerful to its small size. And yet too often we use it so rashly and thoughtlessly. James uses several comparisons to help illustrate this point. For example, the tongue is a fire. The message interprets it this way. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. 
A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. As humans, we have been given dominion and responsibility over creation. And in our history, we have tamed the wildest beast. Lions, tigers, horses. And yet no one can tame something as simple and small and as fully in our control as the tongue. James goes on to say that the tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. Words matter. Many of you have likely heard the lesson, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But James is telling us something similar about the tongue. If you want to know where your heart and soul are, listen to the words your heart and soul produce. With the same voice we sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We also curse the blessings that God has provided in the form of our fellow people people made in the image of God. With the same voice we sing, I love thee, Lord Jesus. And we say, I hate you, neighbor. With the same voice we use in our denomination to call for Christian unity. We gossip about others in our own community, immediately undoing that unity. Again, James is tough. And no one is immune to his teachings. Theologian Casey Sigmund gets right to the point in saying that this double-mindedness, or rather double-tonguedness, is a sin. It is evil. It is brackish water. Hell on earth is enacted when the church is ruddered by loud, evil, unbridled tongues with platforms that reach millions and set the world on fire with hate. I would add the same is true, even if you only have an audience of one. She continues, Our speech moves the body of Christ toward a more just and holy way of being or into idolatry. Each week we say, listen to these words inspired by God as we read the scripture. And that is certainly something we should do. But for these weeks as we explore James, I invite you to be more aware of the words you speak. Because to paraphrase the Gospels, the words your tongue produces, there your heart will be also. So for these three weeks, rather than just listen to these words inspired by God, I encourage you to listen to your own words and ask yourself, are these also inspired by the God in whose image I am made? If we are honest with ourselves, some may be, but many will not. James acknowledges the obvious here that no one is perfect, but James is trying to prepare us to be true followers of Christ taking us beyond a baptism and a profession of faith to actually living out that faith we claim to believe. In this sermon series titled Action, and with it three sermons titled Ready, Set, and Go, we are preparing ourselves to answer God's call to be in the world as the hands and feet of Jesus. You'll of course recognize the Ready, Set, Go idea as one that comes from a race. And as I was watching the Olympics, one thing was constant in every single event. No one just came out and started their contest. Every single athlete readied themselves first. No action was taken until the athlete was fully ready. There was, of course, things like stretching, but even down to the final moment before the event started, whether it was Simone Biles taking that last deep breath before sprinting towards the vault, 
or Noah Lyles running out and pumping up the crowd as a way to energize himself before taking his spot on the starting line. Every single athlete readied themselves before taking action. To not do this would be irresponsible and likely have disastrous results. So we too have to prepare ourselves before we do any of the work of Christ. If they will know we are Christians by our love, then we first must ready ourselves to love. And James is saying a vital part of this, as the song says, Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. But listen, it's not all gloom and doom. You know how to do this work. In fact, you've done it. James is a book of actions, but James is saying first you must ready yourself for action. If you only go out into the world with your tongue blazing freely, you are no longer doing the work of God. You are doing the work of you. Should we call out evil in this world? Of course. But I think James is trying to direct us to a certain way of doing that. For example, when you became, <clears throat> excuse me, an open and affirming congregation, you didn't just run into the street screaming at the top of your lungs. You looked internally first. You readied yourself and asked important questions of yourselves, both individually and as a community. You noticed the evil in the world that was hate spewed towards that community. And rather than saying, God curse those who think differently, even though they too were made in God's image, you did the internal work of carrying the important label of an open and affirming congregation. You wouldn't show up to put out a large fire without water. So why would you show up to do the work of Christ without Christ in your heart, in your mind, and on your tongue? At the end of the day, James is not telling us what to do. James is just reminding us that we have a choice. With the same tongue we can bless, or we can curse. We can gossip, or we can bring together. We can bring joy, or we can bring anger. And if we are to follow Christ, then the choice every time becomes crystal clear. If you believe that God is love, then your words should be loving. If you believe God is a God of peace, then your words should be peaceful. If you believe God is justice, then your words should be just. Because just as fig trees cannot bear peaches, grapevines cannot bear apples, then a Christian tongue cannot bear hate. My friends, go in peace this week, looking for ways to use your words and your tongue to bring peace, love, and joy to everyone you meet. Because we're all made in the image of God and deserve to be treated as such. Have a